Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I know it's late in the afternoon, final day. Um, probably we are standing between you guys and you know your flights or going back home or whatever it is. So we're going to try and keep it as interactive as possible and try and keep you guys involved in the discussions. Hi, I'm Arvind Rajagopalan. I'm a director of uh, Global Technology Services at Verizon. Um, you know, my team and I, we have been working on a journey of you know, building out a data lake for some of the back office functions across finance and supply chain. And you know, uh, Jordan, you want to introduce yourself? Yep, perfect. Um, my name is Jordan Martz, and I am the director of technology solutions at Attunity. So what we do is we're helping support, uh, does anyone have SAP? Perfect. So I'm going to show you how easy it is to map SAP today. Um, which, if you've done that before, it's a nightmare. Um, one of the other things we'll talk about are the ways that people are dealing with enterprise-grade, high-value, high-volume environments, which is Arvin's environment. So thanks for letting us be a part of this. I had to reboot, so all of my demo is being rebooted, so I apologize for sitting for a minute, but I'll let you go ahead and uh, start the presentation. Thank you. Um, how many of you have um, data silos in your corporation? Show of hands, please. Right? That one's obvious, right? And you know, we saw a bunch of hands go up for SAP. You know, obviously, a very popular ERP system. Uh, fairly complicated as well. How many of you have a multi-ERP landscape in your corporations? I got one. I got two. I'm hoping a few more. And are there transactional systems outside of the ERPs that you guys want to marry the data with? You want to do analytics. You want to be able to do discovery and tie it to financials. Nobody wants to do that, right? Anybody? I'm sure. So, so that's kind of what you know, our journey was started out with. So that's exactly what we're going to talk about. Uh, let's see if the clicker works. I'll go it's still to the next. Little weird. Yep, I'll go to the next. Move up. OK. Got one more. There you go. Um, I'm not going to go into all the Verizon stuff. You know, you guys are probably familiar with. Um, large telco provider, uh, getting in the technology space. We have a lot of different offerings. Um, enterprise wireless. Uh, we do a lot of media services. You know, um, we just closed the deal on Yahoo a couple days back. So officially, we are a sponsor, I believe, of the event. <laughs> um, so let's go to the next slide, please, Jordan. Sorry, just put this down, I guess. I'll do it. So um, we talk about what we are all here for, right? And why we are here for, and what are we trying to do? Um, and I think you know uh, this is a need, and I'm sure you've heard this in pretty much every keynote, every discussion. Why big data? What are we trying to do? So I'm not going to bore you guys to death on that. You guys are very familiar with this. Many, many sources, you know. A lot of logs. I heard you know, one of the keynote speakers talk today that we're only capturing 1% of the data uh, that is being generated today. Right? There's a lot more to be captured, a lot more to be analyzed, a um, lot more to be done. Um, you could be on-prem. You could be you know, in the journey of moving to the cloud. So it's definitely relevant from all of those perspectives. Um, from a database perspective, you know, seeing, all, seeing all of it, you know, we have um, the traditional databases, warehouses, Hadoop, uh, in memory has been a part of you know a lot of the different landscapes. Now we are starting to see a lot of that on Hadoop as well. So you're getting better performance. Um, in some cases, you know it's it's competing and doing better than you know the traditional warehouses, etc. So you're starting to see a lot of that as well. But I think um, the last aspect is a key aspect I want to touch upon. Um, you know the real time aspect of it. Right. Um, I think you know for years we lived in a batch mode, we have jobs running overnight, things getting abandoned. How many folks have been, you know, had had jobs in the past where you get paged in the middle of the night, had to take care of something? Show of hands. Yeah, quite a few of you, right? Um, now we are, I think, moving away from that model in a sense that we're moving more towards a real-time enterprise. Um, and what I really mean by that, you know, is, is we have a digital economy round the clock, you know, we have uh, customers and, and suppliers that we work with, you know, our vendors, partners around the globe. Um, everyone is working, right? 
as they say, it's happy hour somewhere. Somebody is always working. Um, you know, so there is an ever-growing need to do more things in real time. And as, as, you know, as we're all moving into a digital economy, and Verizon is actually playing a big role in making a lot of the customers' lives uh, you know, more digitally enabled. And, and that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, but from our context here, I think uh, there is a big need to start streaming data, start looking at data in more real time, and be able to you know, do processing of data as well as be analyze and, and you know, get insights in real time. So you can make timely decisions, you can change your offers, um, you, know, you could change your prices, it could be a lot of different things, um, you know, depending on your need and your use case. Thank you. All right, um, so, so this is again something that you know, a lot of you are probably familiar with, and I'll tell you a little bit about you know, our story and how we started it. Right? We started with, you know, um, in the finance and supply chain, in the back office space, we have a lot of different applications, and I'll just kind of give some examples of applications. We have ERP systems, we have payment systems, we have collection systems, we have settlements, we have uh, you know, other transactional systems. And the historical way of building you know, applications is building one-to-one -one interfaces, where you know, one system passes the data onto another and gets some feedback coming back, and, and, and so on and so forth. Right? So that's kind of the model you know, we all lived in the last you know, um, 15, 20 years. I call that up top there as an app-centric model. Now, what we are trying to move towards, and I think there is a big need for, and I talked about it and a lot of the hands went up, was you know, that app-centric model really what is caused the data silos across your organizations, right? You know, you have each of these systems containing its data. If you need to, you know, share data across, you just build feeds and interfaces, process it in batches, et cetera. So that's really what kind of, you know, um, resulted in that app-centric model. Now we are kind of getting away from those data silos, trying to get away from the app-centric model. We are moving to a data-centric model. And I think that's really where the data lakes play a big role, you know, as you start centralizing the data. And this is exactly what, you know, we at Verizon are doing. And, you know, I heard a lot of other customers, um, you know, a lot of other folks are doing the same thing as well. And I think this is going to enable a lot of different things. You know, and you can see that, you know, now you're going to not have the limitations that you had in your own transaction systems in the past, where you are, you know, bounded by the amount of data the systems can crunch. The, the hardware, be it what it is, what you can store, how much you need to archive, and so on and so forth. So I think you, know, you get over all of those limitations in a more data-centric model. And obviously, sharing data across applications becomes much seamless, and you, know, you are starting to build more intelligence, and the applications, as they work well each other with each other, becomes much better. And I'll give an example of that. Um, you know, a lot of the systems, you know, if you look at, you know, from a network standpoint at Verizon, um, you know, the operations team want to do a, you know, analysis of total cost ownership. And today, that is not an easy exercise, believe it or not, right? You got to look at all the network assets, inventory them. You got to look at it against the financials and, and also keep changing that on a monthly basis based on the depreciation on the assets and so on and so forth to kind of have that number. And it's not an easy number. And then you're also adding on top of that, what is the expense and the maintenance overhead to run these you know, equipment in the network. And now it is being enabled seamlessly as all of this data is coming into a data lake, centralized data lake, and you're able to tie this and do all kind of analysis. That's one of the use cases we are trying to start working on right now. So that's really the big, you know, the takeaway here really is, if you want to really get away from your data siloed you know, environments that you live in today, you gotta really seriously start thinking about, you know, moving on, you know, to a centralized data, data lake kind of platform where you can start putting all the data from the transaction systems and, and get away from the data silos. And, you know, enable seamless access to data for all the applications and, app, you know, data sharing. That's really the key takeaway from the slide here. Jordan? Got it. Thank you. Um, so what's really driving this, right? And I'm going to speak to some of these things in terms of, you know, how it's kind of relevant to us. Uh, if you look at, you know, from a migrating to, you know, um, the data lake and Hadoop, why are we doing some of these things, right? Um, a lot of you might be looking at it from a data reservoir perspective. 
you know, you want to start putting data in a place where you don't have to worry about, you know, um, retention, you don't have to worry about soda archival, you don't have to worry about looking at the temperature of the data, et cetera. So in our case, if you really look at it, you know, we're bringing in all of the uh, CDRs, call detail records, we're starting to put that in. We have those use cases from a revenue assurance perspective, a lot of different aspects, you know, um, from a billing, et cetera. So what this is also enabling is now you're not constrained by what you want to store. You want to only bring a finite set of columns onto a you know, Hadoop platform or a big data platform, and, and you don't have to worry about that anymore. So you're not constrained there. So you can just bring the entire data set as it's available, and you can bring that and store it, and then enable different kind of analysis and analytics on top of that as your users please. So those are some of the use cases from an active archive perspective. And what we really mean is, you know, everything is in one place, all history, all active transaction data. So you don't need to worry about what you need to do differently. And I also kind of spoke about the converging of analytics and data. And that's a key aspect. So, so you, now you bring that data in all in one place from all these various systems. So you enable a lot of, you know, uh, discovery for ad hoc analysis that was never possible in the past. You know, you would have to open up you know, access to your databases. Um, how many DBAs here like to have, you know, users directly access your production databases? Anybody? That's what I thought. So, you know, I, I think that's something that, you know, uh, the data lakes really enable now. And from a self-service perspective, I think the big change, again, you're all very familiar with is schema on read. You're not really worried about, you know, going through extensive IT development life cycles where you need to worry about, you know, getting the understanding of what the data is, model it, do the ETL, and then put it in there, versus you put it in there and then you worry about, you know, when you want to consume it, then you get into more details. And a lot of different use cases around the ETL offload, uh, some of those we are working on. Um, we don't necessarily need, you know, all these transactional systems that we talked about around all these applications. You know, now they all don't need to be beefed up to have a massive compute and storage and, you know, because they were processing ETL in a batch world. Now all of that work is happening in the centralized data lake. So, you know, you don't necessarily need to worry about it. All of that workload is getting offloaded. So that's a huge, you know, um, use case from that standpoint. And we are really already starting to see a lot of gains from operational efficiencies there. So um, I'm going to just touch upon a couple of major aspects of, you know, uh, our architecture here. Um, high-level items. So, you know, so what you see on the right-hand side, um, you know, we're starting at the ERP systems down below and the data sources, and we're going to focus a little bit on the data ingestion, uh, where we are using our partner's uh, solution, Attunity Replicate, um, you know, for the ERP systems, and it's providing us a lot of gains there. So we're going to get the more details on that one. Um, and then we bring the data into the data lake. We apply the security. And then when you want to start consuming it, that's really where you're starting to put it in a schema, et cetera. And, and you put the semantic models. We're using tools like Kaivos. Uh, we are leveraging capabilities um, you know, from other visualiz uh, visualization tools like Tableau, Flick. So that's kind of what makes up our landscape. Uh, and we're doing a, you know, a lot of the different use cases from a discovery perspective for analytics, uh, deep learning, machine learning. We use uh, H2O platforms. And, and, you know, it's actually um, working out really well for us in terms of, you know, providing a lot of these capabilities. So what is this really enabling, right? You look at some of the challenges that a traditional corporation has as you go through some of these are really what you see, right? You want to worry about data in motion. We talked about real-time aspect of it and why it's important. So you want to make sure that you build this architecture around something that supports more like a CDC kind of solution where data is constantly getting pumped in as, it, you know, as the transactions are occurring. So that's very important you enable that. Um, from a scale perspective, um, Verizon, um, obviously Fortune 14, very large corporation. Um, we have a ton of things going on, and you know, we have customers and operations around the globe. Um, a lot of things happening around the clock. So we have a lot of, um, you know, and a ton of customers, um, 110 plus million customers on the wireless side. And, and, you know, we have a lot of um, transactions happening all the time. And to enable that digital environment, um, the 24 by 7 environment, we needed an architecture which could scale to the volume. 
And that was a key aspect, and that's really what you know, we did there. Um, and the breadth and depth, I think I already talked about some of that. You don't need to worry about the number of columns you're bringing in or the number of rows you're going to store. It could be billions. You, know, you don't have to worry about it. You just bring it in, and you start using it. And traceability was you know, a key aspect for us uh, because from a finance standpoint, they want to make sure that the users, uh, they make sure that you know, the numbers are timed from the ERP system to what's landing in Hadoop. So we needed to make sure that we have the lineage. And in Trinity, you know, provides some of those capabilities as well. I want to quickly run to the next one here. And we'll talk about, you know, specifically, you know, kind of deep diving into a little bit of the ingestion framework and what we are doing here. So we use Trinity to replicate, you know, we bring data from all three ERP systems, real time, um, CDCN. And the architecture before we started, you know, leveraging Trinity was more of a, you know, more of a two hop solution, right? We had uh, Golden Gate and SLT for SAP, loading that data, putting it into a stage Oracle database. From there, we would scoop it and put it into Hadoop, right? So we had a two-stop process there. So now with Trinity, you know, it reads from the logs directly and directly delivers it into Hadoop. So it becomes your one-stop solution there, and it works across all the ERPs that we have. We have two large uh, you know, SAP platforms and a PeopleSoft platform. So it enables and works seamlessly across all of them. Um, so that's really some of the key things, and that has you know, helped us simplify our architecture tremendously and go from a you know, two-hop to a single-hop solution, if you will. And some of the other things that we are looking forward to in upcoming solutions, and Jordan, you're going to talk more about yep. that. Uh, there's stuff on the right-hand side we are looking at having data consistency and you know, being able to partition it as we load it into Hadoop. Um, get the visibility and the tracking as the data is in motion, in flight as well, right? And we want to see how we can, you know, automate the merge piece of it because, you know, when you talk about transaction systems, you're making inserts, updates, and deletes. You want to make sure that as you bring that data in, you're not just landing it so it becomes a lot of duplicated rows, but you're also merging it so the transactional piece, the asset pieces are enabled there. Yes, I want to open it up for questions right now. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, can you talk a little bit about the mm -hmm. um, so, so, you know, as I mentioned, you know, once the data is all landing in Hadoop, we actually run micro batches um, to ensure that we catch those transactions and what changed, and merge it into our uh, into the HDFS, you know, file system. So it shows up the latest and greatest transactions, and we do that, uh, you know five, 10 minute frequency, depending on the volume of data and how it's coming. So that's something that you know, was taking a longer time before. And now we are able to go to that model because it's really enabling that to leverage the data landing in Hadoop through Trinity, as well as be able to run your you know, scripts and do whatever you need to do. So it's, it's very helpful from that standpoint. So All right. I'll turn it over to Jordan here. He has some exciting Let's stuff. Start. So I'm going to go a little bit faster because I'm going to time box myself to 10 minutes. I think what Arvind has said and what I've heard from a number of these different environments were um, building data lakes. So this is, uh, so I've been an architect. I've been in like the batch world and, and done that, replaced mainframes and, and those environments. And that's been rather exciting, but also has had its caveats. Hand coding and those things have been difficult. And we all have probably either dealt with that in some way, had frustrations with those type of issues, and just the scalability. We've got a number of different clients that manage these different things. And so when you think about integration points that we work when you see this slide, we've managed to build platforms that can tell you how people are using Yarn, your Teradata, your mainframe, offload it. That's one, but the streaming ingest use case that we talk about is the idea that SAP is really easy to integrate. And so I'm going to skip into here and define for people when they see what we do, how we're an integrated partner to supporting their journey. Where we fit on this chart is only in that OLTP right here. There's tons of streaming ingests, but we have a fit where if you see a relational database, a mainframe, your ERP system, we're the best way for mapping and extracting that data as it's going. So what we, what is this tool replicate and what's interesting about it? So it's adopted by about half of the Fortune 100 for direct delivery, whether it's their cloud or whether it's inside their actual environment for on-premise. 
all these different systems you can extract from your mainframe, you can extract from your Oracle, your SQL server, and it creates that publication, that real-time event, and it has a caching mechanism that will cache in between and be able to filter and transform and persist data sets. Let's, I'm gonna go fast. So, um, keep going. The, um, so this is all the sources and targets. Now this is the one that you probably wanna see. This is all the different things we can connect to and manage. So if Arvin's gonna move to Redshift or he's gonna move to uh, Hortonworks or he's gonna um, move to HD Insight in the cloud, however he wants to move, we're gonna support him. And in the SAP journey, when he moves to HANA, and that becomes a consideration, we'll load HANA as well as the analytic journey. So it, HANA's not just covering his both operational and historical reporting, they can do all their historical analytics and flatten it out. And I think that's been the idea of flattening it out and building that architectural discovery model that we talked about in a maturity model. Let's, let's keep going. Um, so when we define CDC, we're certified for the yarn issues and the resources, but it's actually the way that you bring data over. As soon as it lands, it trickles over. Whenever you need to load it in batch, we can handle that. But there's also this message encoding, and I'm gonna show uh, the environment of loading out of SAP into Kafka, and how that streaming architecture could continue to ingest as we're going. So what we're gonna do is, we're gonna keep going on to like HDF, because it loads into NiFi, and people go there, so let's go to this one real quick, and I will show that yeah. relatively quickly. So what I'm gonna show you right here, is, since we don't have a ton of time, is the ease of use of what we did when we mapped SAP. What I'm gonna show you right now is the business objects. The actual tables underneath are abstracted away, and I'm able to then take these four letter acronyms that no one, um, that actually the help you can go to and figure out the naming conventions. We actually have built a tool for helping you to understand the naming convention and the data model of SAP, but that's something that Arvin uses. It was the complexity and the detail of doing that that became the catalyst for, um, I think, really that was what sold mm -hmm. you. It, it wasn't just almost our ability to replicate, because anybody can replicate, the fact that we've mapped the complexity of SAP. That's what makes us really unique. And this is really unique for being able to do migrations. We took a 15-year-old migration utility project that is all over the place, but we combined it with the ability to replicate in real time from that source infrastructure beneath. So whenever we're going here, and I'm just gonna click and let that slide behind, I wanna get to your demo use cases. And this is kind of one of those, where you could load your SAP operationally and replicate out. They have tools that are trigger-based. They have tools that, um, you know, I, I've been going around with a lot of customers talking about the solution, and a lot of the SAP environments, when you're trying to replicate the data and move it for backup reasons or just some other recovery, the DBAs are working some long hours right now because of the way it impacts the operational source. We're the lightest impact to the operations of HANA and SA any SAP environment available. And we're fully certified on SAP. So that was one of the key things that we do within our product suite. So I'm gonna kick it here because, kick it to here because Arvin told me something interesting and I, I've worked with telecoms in the past and, and it's just something to really think about. It like kind of like blew my mind. We were at, we were at dinner, we we're talking about what we're gonna present and um, I understood telecom because you know network and you think about those things, but think about the drive, not only Verizon, but every telecom has now that in different emerging markets, they have free advertising because the actual B2B aspect funds the actual service. You're not paying for your phone plan. It's actually subsidized in certain markets, India, China, Africa. So how does that affect up market where we're in our markets, in North America, for instance, and other markets? So I'm like, Holy cow, how fast do you have to get your customer profile? How fast are you gonna be trading uh, your data to customers and sharing that data? So it's almost like, not only is Verizon and Yahoo, it just suddenly, like for me, it just went, oh, okay, you're a data company to the max now. Mm -hmm. And it was, I think, I'm sorry, I, maybe I was slow because I've been too techy for too long, but it was one of those moments where I'm like, this is amazing that people are gonna have to build a ton of customer-centric profiling and governance and other details that I think you're really gonna get into, which is yeah. what you guys are doing. Yeah, I'm gonna just talk about a couple of these use cases, um, you know, that we started looking at, you know, as we started pulling data from the different data silos, you know, to be able to provide one Verizon views across things like, you know, spend. How much are we spending on some of the specific, you know, uh, projects or whatever the case is. And from a working capital perspective, you know, the AP teams are looking at what is our working capital at any point in time. And that used to be an exercise that used to take a day or two 
uh, to get that information across multiple ERP landscape uh, with the volumes of data. Now we're there able to get it in, in a matter of hours and minutes. Um, so that, you know, those are some of the things that have been a huge addition. But like what, you know, Jordan mentioned, um, we have a lot of rev share agreements that we work with a lot of different vendors um, across advertising and a lot of different offerings. Um, I think getting the data in real time mm -hmm. and being able to, you know, share that with not just, you know, uh, the users, but also with our, some of our customers is a huge enabler. And those are some of the use cases that we're starting to work on uh, and, and go in there in a the big way. Let's go to the next slide real quick. Um, so, so what are some of the considerations as you start migrating to this architecture, as you start centralizing data? Um, so this are, these are some of the key things uh, that we looked at, and we constantly you know, keep these in mind as guiding principles, and we work through. Um, you know, master data integration, very important. As we look at you know, reporting, BI, different analytics, it's something that enables you know, standard one version of the truth, no matter who's looking at it, which system is looking at it, it's always great to use common definitions in master data. Um, data quality, uh, as the data comes in, uh, looking at some of those things in terms of tying it back to the referential uh, data for integrity purposes, as well as from a you know, duplication, redundancy, and, and you know, um, from aspects, you wanna look at it uh, from a quality aspect, all of the data as it's coming in. Security processes, my coworkers presented slides, we went through the details. Uh, a lot of different details on what are the different layers that we look at from a security perspective. You know, what are we using from the Hadoop stack for authentication, for authorization, um, and ha how additionally are we encrypting data at rest, in motion, et cetera. So we talked about a lot of that. Um, and, and data masking, you know, from a regulatory perspective, being one of, uh, you know, government being one of our key customers, uh, it's very important that we comply with a lot of the regulations. Um, so we always keep that in mind as we go through. And I'm sure some of these are uh, very applicable to all of you. So I would you know, highly recommend that you keep these into consideration as you go on in your journey. So just to raise your hands, I mean, is this what you guys are all thinking about right now, these four things? Do you feel like that's pertinent? Yeah, but we're also thinking about getting that into the system. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's kind of you know, captured in the first circle right there, MDM. Um, but you know, those, are, those are very important aspects. Yeah, we've, uh, we've seen a, a growth in not only the maturity, but the considerations that customers are approaching this journey with. And it's, it's very mature um, to you know, what you would see at enterprise scale are all considerations that, you know, thir Fortune, you're 13, 14? 14. 14. As these guys grow, I mean, naturally any environment's gonna have these requirements. And I'm finding it to be very real that these considerations become key. And the biggest blocker two years ago in the past couple of years has been getting data into Hadoop. I think most uh, people can agree that's been a lot of the largest conversations was what's the gravity, what's the detail of that data. So I think that's one of the key things that, you know, we remove the risk from that with Attunity. And what I think we've been working on is how do we mature that overall conversation? How does that metadata that we supply how does that integrate with the rest of the metadata that you're collecting? Mm -hmm. And I think those are all conversations that are quite relevant to um, not only just being a vendor, but a good partner in this journey. So can we go to the next one? Do you want to showcase some of this? What do you mean for data governance? So from a data governance perspective, you know, we are looking at a lot of different options. And what we have nailed down is we use Colibra. Um, that's a product that we use across the board from a finance and back office perspective for a lot of the mass data and, and governance. Thank you. Sure. So I'm going to do something real quick. And I'm going to show uh, Replicate, which we had previously done um, some work with. It had replicated in this position. Um, I had taken a MySQL machine. And although I can't see it as well, uh, no. Give me one second, because I'm going to have to duplicate my screen. All right. One of the things that I'm going to show right here is kicking off a couple of services. So I had to reload this. But um, one of the things that we do as I'm loading this process is I'm replicating into HDFS. And when I'm bringing all this data in, this is a click and drag and drop interface for dropping data really quickly into HDFS. And something we've worked on together has been the actual, not only the ingest, but then a secondary product that we developed. 
We released it this week. So I kind of wanted to just address the issue of what's paramount when you're extracting from a relational database has been uh, the actual commit information. Now that you have the merge, you can leverage our metadata and you will have as much of reconciliation of inserts and updates and those type of things, but also just the size of the files, the speed and velocity of those environments. Because once you get to hundreds of tables in big environments, you need to have automation. So uh, what I'll make is the claim that we can do every aspect of the automation end to end of ingesting into your landed data and fully administer, generate the tables, generate the infrastructure that you need to load that. And I think that's one of the things that why we were brought together was that he has a lot of data. He's got a ton of data from a lot of different sources and a lot of complexity that he can't consider just the maintenance and the overall reuse and rewrite of different systems. And I think that's key because as you're building these, these tools and what I'm doing right now is literally connecting to H catalog and generating DDL from all the source systems that are available to me. And what I've done in the short span is loaded, how long would it take um, many of you to run a, uh, is this the run button right here? Yep, is that run? I can't see it. All right, was that run? All right, I'm sorry, can't I can't see, see it. Um, yeah, let me run the generate task, and I'm just gonna show you this last part. Sorry. What I'm about to do right now is I'm generating, I'm gonna generate about 50 different statements that you otherwise would have to write by hand. So in the, in the past minute, I've generated and moved 10 tables in a maintainable system that could stream automated, reconciles the deletes, the infrastructure, the details underneath, and completely automate all of that process of loading that entire detail. And I think that's one of the things that made it interesting. And that's why this code is something that, you know, it's all generated Hadoop code under the covers. Yeah, and this is a huge why. differentiator, you know, as we were looking at a lot of different, you know, partners to work with and, you know, doing exactly this, this is a huge differentiator because it automatically reads the DDL changes at the source and pushes to the destination. And it has really allowed us to scale to the kind of volumes that we have about 200,000 tables that are getting replicated to Hadoop on, on a regular basis, like, you know, in real time basis. And there was no way we could have, you know, written code and configured other tools to be able to scale to that those volumes. Yep. Yeah. So I mean, I think I want to leave it to what's next and give somebody s some questions. I'm sure there's some of them now. Yeah, I touched about some of these things, but you know, um, those are really some of the key things that we are looking at as next steps uh, at Verizon and what we want to do. Um, I'm going to open it up for questions, um, please. Well, you know, the question is, you know, how did it impact the network bandwidth and capacity? Um, you know, you're talking to a company that does networking for a job, and, you know, um, no, we, we did not run into these problems. But, you know, we, we kind of planned this ahead of time, and we made sure what kind of volumes are going in. Uh, but these are not the only things, right? So you basically, instead of, you know, sending 100 gigs overnight, now you're really just splitting that and sending in real time. So you're really kind of, you know, optimizing and using the network throughout the day as you go. So, it's really kind of making it easy and, and optimize the usage from that standpoint. I think that's the paramount thing that I've learned about Hadoop over the past year is that all sources streaming in have to all of them be at a stream. And I think that's not only we're always hearing streaming in these architectures that we're talking about, but you know what we want to be is a publisher. We want to turn everything in your business into a publisher into the lake. And lakes aren't working until they're really at that, at least you found a consistency of latency that you're landing your data and managing it with. So that's one of the key things, and, and I know that's something that we do, but I think I've, I've seen this firsthand that it turns the, why do we invest in Hadoop, and then all of a sudden that customer comes back, that's in your business, comes back and says, oh, it's all real time, because they're hoping from that investment, and that mm -hmm. changes the formula, because now you're guaranteed a way of at least communicating that not only that everything's real time, right? And the business now has to adapt to it because you've now changed a, what was a yesterday's process or a two hour late process or whatever it was into a fully latent, everything's being loaded environment. And most of our customers, you know, the slowest data set that they like tell is sometimes like five minutes. Like, hey, the data is five minutes late, you know? So you have actionable intelligence that marries what's in SAP operationally with what you're getting reported out in any of your BI tools. 
So that's one of those things that we found to be really powerful. As part of that maturity, when you had those data reservoir, analytical, those lakes, there's this whole data prep thing, which becomes you know a little bit upstream from where we just talked about with Compose and Replicate, mm -hmm. but it's a way of doing discovery analytics because you're just leaving it flat and you're enriching it. And then you can operationalize it and make it strategic, et cetera. But those are different ways to move that data set. You had a question? Go ahead. No, we, we've been packaged in with SQL Server since 2005 as, uh, you know, when you're moving Oracle to SQL Server, you may have seen that folder inside of there. But one of the cool things about it is we're actually reading from the transaction log. So there's no trigger based. I mean, it's like literally as soon as it hits the database engine, the log file that's collecting the transaction, we're replicating it out to a new location. Good. Can you manage Presto table as well? So which tables? A Presto table? Yes, yes. We can load into a table that can be picked up by Are you talking about Presto? pool and cluster table in SAP? SAP Presto. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. So that was one of the key considerations for us to go with, you know, Attinity, because, you know, like Jordan was talking about earlier, Attinity has the secret sauce to decode the proprietary SAP structures in cluster and pool tables. At the temporal level, right? Like the... The actual, you t take pool and cluster tables and you look at like sales and finance, right? Some have date time, some don't. Some have to go back down to multiple tables to join. We abstract you away from even having to consider that issue. So that's all driven by a layer inside of SAP that communicates the boppies, the calls that need to be addressed to tell you what tables, and we're natively then replicating those tables immediately. So as soon as they land in SAP, we have translated what landed and replicated it out from that landing. No, this is proprietary. This is um, the, the migration utility we purchased a couple of years ago had been around for 15 years doing migrations. That's the metadata layer. It gives you the data model. We understand it. So we, it has about 200 implementations. So it's a pretty well-vetted um, product in the market. And so it's like a 15- and 10-year-old product that just merged. So it's worked out really well. I think we have like time for one last question. Well, I mean, semi and, and unstructured could be just fields within a database, right? So as long as it's a relational database or a, a mainframe or, or any, even SAP, any of those different complex structures that have uh, some relational background, Teradata, yes, then we can handle them, absolutely. All right, did you have a question? DBF? I mean, we can get back to you after this on those type of particulars. All right, thank you all. Thank you.